Hello, and welcome back to another episode of OzPol Explained. I'm your host, David, and I'm here to explain all the questions you have about Australian politics that you were too lazy to Google. Today's episode is all about how to remove a Prime Minister from office. Have you ever wondered, what does it take to get rid of a Prime Minister? I mean, probably. Most people at some point have quite likely wondered that question. No matter who is Prime Minister or what party they are from, they do not have 100% approval rate from the public, so there is someone out there who probably thinks that whoever the Prime Minister is, they are the worst one in all of history. Personally, I really don't like Edmund Barton, the first Prime Minister. Yeah, that's right. I don't like him. He knows what he did. It's the White Australia policy. Possibly you're just curious because you've heard that the US has this thing called impeachment and you're curious, does Australia have that? Simply put, there are many ways to remove a Prime Minister from office. Some are specific to a Prime Minister and others just apply to any member of Parliament. The pretty obvious one is an election. And so just like my suitcase one week after I've returned from holiday, I'm not going to bother unpacking that. So let's explore all the different scenarios and go on a magical educational journey. Woo! Ah, oh, learning is magic. First off, they can't just be expelled from Parliament. In 1920, Hugh Mahon, a member of the House of Representatives, was expelled from Parliament for seditious and disloyal utterances. He called for an Australian Republic. The then Prime Minister Billy Hughes moved for him to be expelled from Parliament. This is unique in all of Australian history. Section 49 of the Constitution says that the Parliament can declare the powers, privileges and immunities of its houses. Which sounds like a great rule, right? Imagine having it in your work contract that you can just give yourself whatever benefit you like. Wow, I sure hope no one abuses that power. The writers of the Australian Constitution took inspiration from the British House of Commons, which has the power to dismiss members. This meant that the Australian Parliament could dismiss members from office up until 1987, when the Parliamentary Privileges Act removed this power. Even though it had only been used once, the Parliament thought that, hey, maybe the ability to remove people, say political opponents from office so long as you had a majority, was not a great power to have. Section 7 and 24 of the Constitution say that politicians should be directly chosen by the people, which implies that the Parliament shouldn't be allowed to just kick people out. It took 86 years for someone to look at that and think, hmm, oh, maybe we should be a bit stricter about that one. But also it comes as no surprise to me because the constitution is literally a form of terms and conditions and who has ever read the terms and conditions? I bet you've never read the terms and conditions of anything, let alone the constitution. I know I haven't yet. Look, I'm halfway through the constitution. It's not exactly a page turner. It's got no sense of dramatic tension or character development. And it's also very law heavy. That's law as in L-O-R-E, not L-A-W. And yes, that was the best pun I could think of. You're welcome. This does hypothetically mean in the future, the parliament could legislate to amend the Parliamentary Privileges Act to reintroduce this power. Though then I'm pretty sure the high court would rule against that, so probably not. So for now, it doesn't exist. You can't just get angry at someone and be like, you are forced out of the position. Even if this power did still exist, it would be a strange situation to be used against a sitting prime minister, far more likely to be used against an ordinary member of parliament, as it would require a majority to put into action. That doesn't mean that it's impossible. It could have happened several times throughout history. Nowadays, if a member of a party does something disgraceful, there is usually two options. Either the party removes that person from their party and they sit as an independent, or the party no longer gives them pre-selection in the next election, and at the end of the term is the end of their career. Of course, if someone is facing a scandal of very large proportions, there's always just the option of resigning. Speaking of which, few Prime Ministers retire from politics willingly. 
Robert Menzies, Australia's longest serving Prime Minister, decided after a lengthy political career to just retire. Just be done with it. Only two other Prime Ministers, Andrew Fisher and Edmund Barton, have retired from politics while Prime Minister. The rest were removed from the position in different ways. Some have resigned from the position of Prime Minister but then remained in office for reasons that I will get to later. Another thing that happens very rarely is death. Well, not like in general, but I mean for sitting Prime Ministers. The most famous example of a Prime Minister dying is Harold Holt. He went swimming on Cheviot Beach in 1967 and then was never seen again, presumably drowning in a rip and being taken out to sea. Or if you're a conspiracy theorist, he didn't die, but he was actually taken by the Chinese in a submarine to live a life in China after 40 years of being a Chinese spy. This whole conspiracy theory was spawned by a basically a novel length book called The Prime Minister Was a Spy by Anthony Gray. An imaginative title, I know. It's bad. I've read it. It's bad. It's bad. It's nonsense. I had to have it retrieved by the state library from a storage stack and no one had gotten it out in like over 10 years. It's a bad book from like 80s? 70s? The whole book is based off what a retired Navy officer told Gray saying that a bunch of just Chinese businessmen had told him the truth of this mammoth spy operation. You know, casually over several meetings because, I don't know, the Chinese government figured, oh, oh yeah, people are gonna learn about it eventually, so let's just get ahead of the story and just tell people our international spies were up to, just casually. You know how governments, especially China, love to talk about their spy operations openly and without prompting? You know how governments do it all the time? Because transparency, when it comes to spy operations, is super, uh, super good? Yeah. I also read a conspiracy theory that he was assassinated because he was going to pull troops out of the Vietnam War. Then I read another conspiracy theory that he was assassinated because he was going to send more troops into the Vietnam War. Huh. Hmm. Hmm. -mm. That doesn't seem right. Only two other Prime Ministers have died in office, Joseph Lyons and John Curtin. Lyons died of a heart attack in 1939. He was the first Prime Minister to die in office. He was actually ready to retire, but unfortunately died before he could. John Curtin also had a heart attack in November 1944, and his health declined, dying in July of 1945. He was just a few weeks away from living to see the end of World War II. And that's it. The oldest person to become Prime Minister was John McEwen at age 67. So Prime Ministers tend not to get so old that they unexpectedly die. They also don't get assassinated. Unlike in the US, Australia actually has very little political violence. No Prime Minister has had an assassination. This is probably because assassination is very wrong and bad. And 10 out of 10 lawyers say, don't do that. And also, who are you? And how did you get into my office? And why are you asking very suspicious questions about political assassinations? For comparison, I looked up the list of assassinations of presidents in the USA, and 11 out of the past 14 have had assassination attempts. And then of course, there's the one successful assassination of JFK in 1963. So the past 14 presidents goes back to 1929 when Herbert Hoover was elected. From that point onwards, nearly every single president has had an assassination attempt, if not several. The exceptions being Eisenhower and Johnson. As far as I'm aware, no one tried to kill them, so hopefully the statistic I said was right. If not, there's been even more political assassinations than I had previously expected. Hey America, are you, like, are you are you okay? That doesn't mean that we have had zero political violence in Australia. John Newman, a member of the New South Wales Legislative Assembly, was unfortunately a victim of a political assassination in 1994 when he was shot to death. This is somewhat regarded as Australia's first proper political assassination. 
though other politicians have been murdered in the past. So you can see that is quite rare. Someone attempted to assassinate Queen Elizabeth in 1970 during her Australian tour by rolling a large log in the path of a train that she was on, aiming to derail the train to harm those inside of it. The perpetrator is still unknown. Ah uh, yes, the classic assassination weapon. A misplaced log. Arthur Calwell, leader of the Australian Labour Party from 1960 to 1967, survived an assassination attempt in 1966. A man shot him with a rifle through a car window. The bullet was deflected by the car window and so Calwell only received minor injuries to his chin. His assailant later apologised profusely to Calwell and then Calwell sent him a letter forgiving him. Aw, sweet. I probably wouldn't do that if someone tried to kill me. I am pretty forgiving, but also like, personally, if you do try and kill me, I will consider our friendship just over, you know? You're no longer invited to any of my parties or future events, and assassination is an instant unfriend on Facebook in my book. So, not cool, dude, not cool. So as you can see, political violence, thankfully, is quite rare in Australia. Okay, so here's some examples that have actually removed a Prime Minister from office, not just what could hypothetically do it. The party just tells them to leave. Prime Ministers are leaders of parties, and so, therefore, they require party approval to gain and then remain in that position. This means that a leadership spell can remove them from the position. We've seen this several times in the past dozen years, and that's not the only time it has happened in history. Kevin Rudd of Labour was replaced by Julia Gillard in 2010, and then Gillard then replaced Rudd in 2013. Tony Abbott of the Liberal Party was replaced by Malcolm Turnbull in 2015, and then Turnbull was replaced by Scott Morrison in 2018. This all happened partway through someone's term. So, as a result of this, we have not seen a Prime Minister serve a full term from one election to the next since 2007, as of this video. So comment down below if you're watching this in the future and we finally had a Prime Minister serve a full term. I wonder when it will happen. Here's the thing, a leadership spill works differently from party to party. There's no law that actually dictates exactly what the rules should be, and so party rules can just be changed. In 2013, Labour decided after two leadership spills, it would increase the threshold for a successful challenge to be from 50% of its members to 60% if it's in opposition, or 75% if in government. So it takes three quarters of the Labour Party room to remove a Labour Prime Minister. The Liberal Party, on the other hand, took until 2018, with Morrison becoming Prime Minister to change their party rules. It now requires two thirds of a party room majority for a successful leadership challenge. Scott Morrison cleverly put this into effect after he had successfully taken advantage of it not being so strict. Lucky, right? Wow, what convenient timing. If only Turnbull had paid closer attention to the previous 10 years of Australian politics, and also the very method in which he had become Prime Minister himself. So thanks to the change of these party rules, we'll hopefully see the end of our biannual tradition of a leadership spill replacing the Prime Minister. Fingers crossed. Only time will tell though. Unfortunately, as this means we'll be replacing our Prime Minister less often, it does mean you do need to find a different way to remind you to change the battery in your smoke alarm. Maybe you could set a phone reminder. Please test your smoke alarm. It's important and saves lives. Of course, it's important to know that this method only removes them from the position of Prime Minister. It doesn't remove them from the Parliament. Unless you're Malcolm Turnbull and you decide, well, that sucked, time to quit and go on a holiday to New York because I want to. If you're curious as to what removes them from Parliament entirely, well, there's the next option. They are found ineligible by the Constitution. Section 44 outlines the various ways a politician is made ineligible to sit in Parliament. It's actually really important. There are actually five subsections. And oh boy, if you thought I was really into sections of the Constitution, then get ready for subsections. Oh baby, let's get specific. 
Section 44 says that you can't be in Parliament if you are under the acknowledgement, allegiance, obedience, or adhere to a foreign power, or are a subject citizen or entitled to the rights or privileges of a citizen of a foreign power. Don't worry, I will explain all of that. Or you are guilty of treason or being convicted of any offence punishable of one year or longer. Bankruptcy. Hold any office of profit under the crown or if you have a pecuniary interest in any agreement with the public service of the Commonwealth. Okay, so let's start with section 44, 1. Allegiance, obedience, privileges of foreign power, etc, etc. The best known example of this is dual citizenship. We had a dual citizenship crisis that disqualified a bunch of politicians back in 2017 and 2018. That was just a wild time and honestly it should have a video of its own because so many people were just suddenly not allowed to be in Parliament anymore. Malcolm Turnbull even briefly lost his majority in the House of Representatives. Turns out a lot of people don't check if they have dual citizenship. And to be fair, the rules regarding citizenship vary from country to country. Barnaby Joyce, despite being born in Australia, unknowingly had dual New Zealand citizenship by descent from his father. Yeah, weird. Some countries require you to be born in that country to have citizenship automatically. Some give it to you if your parents are from that country and some places you can apply for it depending on where your grandparents were born. Here's the thing, a politician is perfectly fine to be elected if they were born in another country, so long as they don't have citizenship of that country. So many people have renounced it before going into office. Quite a few prime ministers weren't born in Australia. Six of them were born in Great Britain. Recent examples include Tony Abbott, who was born in London, and Julia Gillard, who was born in Wales. There are two exceptions to this. There is John Gordon, who was probably born in New Zealand, and Chris Watson, who was born in Chile and then raised in New Zealand. A politician simply just needs to renounce their dual citizenship before nomination. The thing is, the AEC, which you need to register with to become a politician, doesn't actually check your eligibility. It's up to the candidate to say that they are eligible, and if they are discovered to not be eligible, they are then taken to the High Court. Prime Ministers haven't actually been removed by this section, but that could just be because people haven't checked. Who's to say all those British Prime Ministers actually renounced their dual citizenship? We're unsure. Particularly Chris Watson. We're not sure. We just didn't check if he was eligible or not. And John Gorton, who was maybe born in New Zealand or Melbourne, is unclear. There's conflicting information about whether or not he was actually born in New Zealand. Um, his dad told him that he was, but he has some paperwork that says he might have been born in Melbourne. Uh, but then he also put down on some paperwork that he was from New Zealand. It's who knows, but no one took him to the high court. So potentially those prime ministers and maybe even more served as prime minister unknowingly having dual citizenship. So if a prime minister did discover that they had dual citizenship, they would just be ejected from Parliament. During the dual citizenship crisis, Tony Abbott actually provided evidence that he'd long since renounced his British citizenship to prove to his critics that they couldn't remove him, though his party had already removed him from the position of Prime Minister years prior. Here's the thing. The conditions of disqualification cannot be retroactively fixed mid-term. So if a politician had dual citizenship, got elected, realized they had dual citizenship, then renounced it, they can still be removed from office because they were ineligible at the time of nomination. Of course, whatever makes a politician ineligible can then be resolved and they can just come back next election. Barnaby Joyce, the former deputy prime minister, was found to be ineligible due to dual citizenship. And so he was removed from office which then left his seat empty, so there was a by-election, which the, he then just won back mid-term. So being forced out of Parliament by the High Court might actually just not stop you from returning. So it is actually possible that a Prime Minister can be removed for an 
previously unknown dual citizenship, all it will take is a little negligence and the right circumstances. Section 44, subsection 2. They commit a crime or treason. People are disqualified from holding office if they are convicted of treason or a crime that has a jail sentence longer than a year. This means that politicians may have criminal records, but so long as the jail term wasn't a year or longer, that's fine. William Henry Groom was a member of the first parliament of Australia and also a convict who had been transported to Australia for being convicted of stealing. He unfortunately died just a few months into his term in August of 1901. John Curtin was sentenced to three months in jail for failing to comply with a compulsory medical examination for conscription in 1914. He was thankfully then released after three and a half days in jail thanks to some friends who intervened with the help of a senator. He would then go on to become Prime Minister in 1941. So he was the first Prime Minister who was convicted of a crime, though before he was Prime Minister. Look, Prime Ministers haven't actually been removed from office due to crimes ever in the history of Australia yet. There's also the option of treason. Don't worry, I've googled how to commit treason so you won't need to. And it's probably put me on some kind of a list, but Oh well, I'm sure I can expect that ASIO or the AFP will come knocking at my door shortly after I finish uploading this video. And without further ado, ways to commit treason include assisting in any way with an organization engaged in armed hostilities with the defense force or aiding an enemy at war with the Commonwealth or preparing an act of war against the Commonwealth or causing death or harm to or imprisoning or restraining the governor general, prime minister, sovereign, the heir apparent of the sovereign or the concert of the sovereign. So just imagine, right? Nicolas Cage, but he's Australian and also the prime minister somehow. And he decides that he's going to kidnap the queen. That would make him ineligible to run for parliament. It also make an interesting plot for National Treasure 3. Call me Disney. Let's get it done. See, I'm not sure how general the High Court would get with the wording of that definition. So like, with relation to the word harm, could the Prime Minister just like, punch Prince Charles once? Like, is that, does that still count? If you happen to be a lawyer, comment down below what you think is the boundary a person would need to cross before it becomes treason. It's a fun speculative game I like to call is this treason? Let's publicly express our opinions. Don't commit it though, but don't do treason. Just don't. Look, like I said, this video is about the ways that prime ministers can be removed. It doesn't mean that they ever will be by these methods. Obviously, it's far more likely that like just an ordinary MP will be able to break these rules compared to the prime minister. For starters, the prime minister can't kidnap themselves. The Prime Minister is far more likely to commit a different kind of crime, like potentially electoral fraud. Pauline Hanson almost went to jail for three years for electoral fraud, but the charges were removed on appeal and she only spent 11 weeks in jail. This is different from impeachment, which is a thing found in many world governments, but you're probably most familiar with the term because of the US specifically how Trump was impeached in the House of Representatives and then acquitted in the Senate. Impeachment in the US is a constitutional method of removing officers of the US federal government. Most famously, this refers to the president, but historically is actually a process that is mostly used to get rid of judges. Impeachment requires a majority in the House of Representatives and then a two thirds majority in the Senate. We don't have impeachment in Australia for prime ministers, and we also don't have the same legal protections that the president is afforded in the US for some reason. So if the prime minister did something scandalous enough to be on trial for a crime, they would most likely just resign before it got really bad because it would damage the party if they stayed on. You know, the logical thing to do. Section 44, subsection three, bankruptcy. Bankruptcy for some reason just makes you ineligible. 
Senator Rodney Cullerton, who was elected as a One Nation candidate before becoming an independent shortly afterwards, was found to be bankrupt. It wasn't why he was removed from Parliament though, it was because of his larceny conviction. Only he had travelled forward in time and seen the previous few minutes of this video, or read the Constitution. I literally just went over this, Rodney. Just did it. Please don't do crimes. Please. And also, don't kidnap the Queen or Prime Minister. The Prime Minister, of course, is subject to this rule as well, though the Prime Minister does get paid over half a million dollars per year and has a lot of benefits to cover costs. The salary also generally goes up every financial year or so, so unless they're really bad with money and somehow get massively in debt, it's unlikely that a PM will be kicked out for going bankrupt. So I guess if you really want to get rid of a Prime Minister, you really need to sweet talk them into investing into some very dodgy business practices like an app or something that, you know, costs lots of money and you're willing to tank for political vengeance. Though this isn't really an instructional guide, this is just more of like the potential ways in which it could happen. Hey. It is possible. Section 44, subsection 4, holding an office of profit under the crown. Look, I said I know some of these aren't going to apply to a prime minister except in rare circumstances, but this is like the least relevant section of all time, and so I'm not going to spend much time on it. Basically, it means you can't get elected if you hold a specific list of jobs like working for a parliamentary secretary or uh, the governor general or a federal magistrate. You'd have to resign from that position first to then run for office. I'm only mentioning as part of section 44, there's no way a prime minister would take on the additional role during parliament. It doesn't make sense, especially because the moment that they gain that position, they immediately get removed from office. This is really only relevant to people who want to run for office for the first time, so take this more as an instructional guide for you if you ever want to run for politics. Beware, if you're running for parliament, there are like so many roles. Terms and conditions, man. What do they say? Who knows? Look, we've all probably sold our soul at this point just by clicking yes. Who knows what website has it? Is it Neopets? Maybe Neopets has it. Maybe that's why my Neopets can never die. They're legally entitled to own my life essence and it's keeping them alive. Fun fact, Apple product terms and conditions forbid people from using their devices to design, manufacture, or produce nuclear or biological weapons. So take that terrorists. Don't bomb a building with a bomb you built with your MacBook or you can be sued. This has been fun terms and conditions facts with David, I guess. Section 44, five, pecuniary interests. A person cannot be in parliament if they have any direct, indirect pecuniary interests or agreement with the public service. Pecuniary, by the way, is relating to money. I know, I learned a new word thanks to this video that I will never use again and likely you will never use either, but that's what it says. This is to avoid conflicts of interest. It also very rarely gets exercised. Wow, what a surprise. I'm sorry to disappoint you. I trust me, I will tell you the, the more definite ways a prime minister gets removed very soon. It was first examined by the High Court in 1975 with the example of National Country Party Senator James Webster. It was only examined by a single judge. Webster was a shareholder and managing director of a company that supplied timber and hardware through a public tender to the Postmaster General's Department and the Department of Housing and Construction. The High Court ruled that this wasn't enough. They found that in the agreement of the person said to be disqualified must be pecuniary in the sense that through the possibility of financial gain by the existence or the performance of the agreement, that person could conceivably be influenced by the Crown in relation to parliamentary affairs. So didn't seem like enough of a conflicting interest to that one judge. So it seems like the ability to breach this is narrow, but it has actually happened. Family First Senator Bob Day actually was found to be ineligible thanks to this section. He was found ineligible when the High Court revisited this subsection in 2017. Day had a rental agreement for his electoral office and it was paid for by the Commonwealth, but 
the property was owned by an entity that made rental payments into Day's bank account. So instead of having his rent subsidized by the government, he was making a profit on it. So hey, it's rare, but this does mean that this can apply to a prime minister. Who knows what a prime minister could do that would serve their own interests in a monetary fashion. All you need for this to apply is for a prime minister to think that they're very sneaky, to be corrupt, and to be stupid enough to get caught. Thankfully, every single prime minister in Australian history has been morally pure and decent to their very core. Except Edmund Barton, a massive racist and also several subsequent Prime Ministers who were also massive racists. Okay, look, I know a lot of these don't seem to apply to Prime Ministers, usually because PMs would think ahead or it's very specific, but let's get to something that is very specifically about a Prime Minister. A motion of no confidence. A motion of no confidence can not only just remove a Prime Minister, but it can also lead to a change of government entirely, as it can result in an election. Basically, a motion of no confidence requires a majority in the House of Representatives to say that, well, they've lost confidence. Conventionally, then this leads to resignation and an election. Remember though, convention is the government's way of saying, well, we tend to do it like this way, so technically it's not a rule, but we're probably going to do it. But it's not a rule. Look, this is very difficult to happen because normally the government requires a majority in the House of Representatives to, you know, be the ruling government. So except in rare instances, like a hung parliament, it's kind of impossible without a member of the government being so mad at their own party as to defect. Here's the thing, no successful motion of no confidence has actually happened in Australian history. Sorry to disappoint, but there have actually been several chances that this could have happened even recently. Alfred Deakin resigned in 1904 after an amendment for a bill was defeated. It's important to note that Deakin had only a little over a third of the seats in the House of Representatives. It was possible at any time for bills to be defeated. That's just how it was in the early years of Australian Parliament. No party had a majority until Labour in 1910. So Deakin was replaced by Chris Watson, who resigned four months after an amendment was defeated on a bill. He was replaced by George Reid, which, you guessed it, resigned in 1905 because an amendment was defeated. He was replaced by Alfred Deakin, who would serve his second time as Prime Minister until 1908, when, you'll never guess what happened, spoilers, he resigned following a defeat of an amendment. He was replaced by Andrew Fisher, who resigned and was replaced by Alfred Deakin again. Third time lucky, am I right? Wrong. Less than a year later, you'll never guess who was back as Prime Minister. Did you guess Andrew Fisher? Gold star to you, correct. Wow, and you thought leadership spells were frustrating. We have changed Prime Ministers nine times in the first 13 years of Australia, and there were only six different people in that position. These resignations were the choice of the Prime Minister, not the Parliament. Parliament could have moved for a motion of no confidence, but didn't. Recently, Scott Morrison lost control of the House in 2019 when the Medivac bill passed against his wishes. The government had lost its one-seat majority at the resignation of Malcolm Turnbull after the Liberal Party had forced him out from the position of Prime Minister. Independent Karen Phelps then won the by-election in Wentworth. She provided the government with confidence and supply, meaning that the government could continue to function with a de facto majority except when it came to Medivac. Phelps, a former president of the Australian Medical Association, put forward a bill that allowed doctors to authorise the evacuation of refugees from indefinite detention on Manus Island and Nauru to receive medical care in Australia. 
The Liberal Party was opposed to the bill and had spent years fighting court orders to allow medical evacuations. Some refugees had even been waiting for medical care that had been refused to them for up to five years. The United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees has long criticised Australia's long outstanding poor health care towards refugees in indefinite detention. Phelps argued that we needed to overcome a dangerous and bureaucratic system of transfer that was incredibly slow and not just only needlessly cruel but also has killed people. For example, Hamid Kaizai, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, had died on Manus because of a minor infection in his leg that wasn't given medical care. His transfer happened several days after doctors had recommended it and as a result he had a heart attack leading to brain death in 2014. Faisal Ishak Ahmed also had tried repeatedly to get medical care but unfortunately died of a seizure in 2017. The Liberal Party fought hard against this bill saying that if we give medical care to sick refugees then more refugees will come even though the bill specifically only covered refugees that were already in detention so that didn't really make sense as an excuse. With the support of Labour and the crossbench, Phelps managed to get the bill passed in historic victory against the government. The last time the government was defeated on a significant piece of legislation was in 1941. Because of this, refugees were temporarily allowed to be transferred to Australia to receive proper medical care. Hypothetically, this defeat in the House meant that the government was actually open to a motion of no confidence. Hypothetically, the government could no longer block any bill because anyone from any party could introduce one and with enough support could get it through Parliament. So naturally a motion of no confidence was possible but it was not put forward and so instead of resigning like previous Prime Ministers had, Morrison just ignored this and carried on to an election in May. The Liberals then regained a majority in the House of Reps and repealed Manivac thus making it harder for innocent refugees to access proper medical care. The Scott Morrison government currently has 77 seats with a minimum of 76 needed to form a majority. So hypothetically if two members of the Liberal or National Party resign, are found ineligible, die or are replaced by or turned into independents or a member of another party, then hypothetically it is possible for Morrison then to return to a minority and a motion of no confidence to happen. Hypothetically, someone watching this video could think that I have a really good screen presence and offer me a high paying job as some kind of TV presenter or an educational TV show. ABC, I'm looking at you. I'd be open to it especially because COVID-19 means I no longer have a job. Until that time, I have a Patreon that you can support me, link in the description. This brings us to the final way to get rid of a Prime Minister and this one is very definitive. There is no recourse for the Prime Minister and there is no way that they can challenge this. It is completely out of their hands and that is dismissal. The Governor General is responsible for swearing in a new Prime Minister. Turns out they can also dismiss a Prime Minister in rare circumstances. Gough Whitlam is the only Prime Minister to ever be dismissed from office by the Governor General. In 1975, the Liberal held Senate refused to pass any bills put forward by the Labour held House of Representatives until an early election was called. This meant that the government was incapable of functioning. Nothing could pass and it created a deadlock, which meant they couldn't pass bills to do with money and if this continued, a lot of things wouldn't get funded and an economic disaster would just ensue. Whitlam initially wanted to wait to see if the opposition would cave into pressure, but the deadline to get bills passed to avoid funding issues was looming. Whitlam's next solution was to call a Senate half election to try and resolve this deadlock. However, before he could request that, John Kerr, the Governor General, at the time had a different plan. This sparked massive controversy because he used his reserve powers and fired Whitlam. 
He then placed the Liberal leader, Malcolm Fraser, as Prime Minister instead and then called an election. Now, before you think, oh, cool, there's a precedent, it can happen again, consider that this is referred to as the 1975 Constitutional Crisis. Kerr resigned from his position early and, like, left the country. This was a massive controversy and not something that happened lightly. Kerr's successor as Governor General, Paul Hasluck, said that this was a mistake to have exercised the Governor General's reserve powers in that manner, and he personally probably wouldn't have done it or acted on Malcolm Fraser's advice to fire Whitlam. He also said that the function of the Governor General is not to be the honest broker in political situations. Frankly, this was seen as an overstep, and conventionally, Kerr should have listened to Whitlam and discussed a solution before firing him. I also have a video about the role of the Governor General and the powers, so check out that after you've finished with this. Turns out, they can actually do a lot. But, basically, although the Governor General has the power to dismiss members of Parliament and block bills and even suggest changes to bills, they're not seen as a position that holds much sway in political opinions. They're there to oversee and facilitate the functioning of government, not to bend it to their will, and conventionally only act on the advice of the Prime Minister. Though, remember what I said earlier, convention is not the same as a rule. It's highly unlikely that we will see a repeat of the 1975 constitutional crisis. The Governor General even then only interfered because the government simply didn't function at all. So, for as long as a Prime Minister manages to get bills passed, regardless of the content of those bills, there's no reason to expect that the Governor General would interfere at all. The government usually doesn't control the Senate anyway, and since then we have not had a party threaten to use the Liberal Party's tactics of blocking supply. It's not impossible for it to happen again, but it could potentially renew an interest in a Republic movement where Australia replaces the Queen and Governor-General with a President. It's in the interest of the Governor-General not to repeat the crisis of 1975 so as to keep their position so, there you have it. Thank you so much for making it all the way through this video. Hypothetically, there are a lot of ways that Prime Ministers can be removed from office, though in reality, as we have seen, there are actually not that many that happen. Usually, it really is mostly an election, or recently, a leadership spill. Some of these ways that a Prime Minister can be removed arise from carelessness, some can pop up unexpectedly, and some are purely hypothetical methods that have never been used in Australian history. But hey, one day, one of them might happen, and then you'll be like, I knew it! I knew it could happen! I've prepared myself, and now I can explain what's happening to my friends and family vaguely, because I know what pecuniary interest means. You might be able to use that word yet. Perhaps, though, this video is more of an instructional video for you if you have a future political career and you want to know what pitfalls to avoid. I bet some politicians really wished that they had double-checked the rules about dual citizenship beforehand to save themselves a lot of trouble a few years ago. But yes, an election remains the strongest way to remove a Prime Minister from office, and to do that, you need to get out there have conversations with people and connect with others so that they can see your political point of view and maybe work together to change the results of the next election. Voting does make a difference, so please make sure that you get involved, support a party you like, and learn more about politics, which you can do by subscribing and sharing my videos. Thank you so much for watching. As always, there is a Patreon in the description where you can support this channel. There is a link in the description to a copy of the script full of citations so you can learn more about the things that I have referenced here or use them in assignments. Thank you so much and I will see you next time. Goodbye.